black men native to Oakland, California into a BART train. BART is a rail system in the, Bay Area, in the Bay Area similar to those in New York and Chicago. These men do not know one another. They never have, they never will, but beyond their own awareness, they share an experience together on this train. They are both dressed in black. The darkness of their clothes complements the night their smiles are. Constellations so close, so unmistakable. They are both loud, rambunctious, excited as they sit amongst friends. They are returning from an auspicious morning. Indeed, there is no greater dawn than a new year. In a beautifully still moment, sharing eye contact with one another and making a human gaze which a black body can only know from another black body, their dreams intertwined and it was here. Oh, it was here Oscar Grant and I silently shared stories of our humanness. He pulled his gaze from me and positioned it on three approaching white men. The already loud train became louder, but this loud was strange. It was angry and uncertain. And despite the cry of bystanders, the white men who initiated the fight were not touched or interrogated. Oscar and his friends pre pleaded for freedom. They resisted, rightfully so, but Oscar was the most passionate. I'm sure his baby girl was on his mind, excited to be a free man for his daughter's fourth birthday. The officer, a tall, middle-aged white man, lanky in his movement, forced Oscar's face to the floor and dug his right knee into the bottom of Oscar's spine, and, and it was here. It was here I caught his eyes once more. And they told me stories of his humanness. They showed me where he was supposed to go, what he was supposed to do, and who he was supposed to become. But then his eyes began to whisper. Those dreams became unclear. And soon they were silent. Cries shot out from the depths of the train. Cries deep and screeching rang out from Oscar's friends, and cries for freedom would carry Oakland, California into a 17-day uprising. How could you shoot him in the back like he is not even human? I have never forgot the stories in his eyes. Can we give the dancers a round of applause, please? January 1st, 2009, Oscar Grant was murdered by BART police in Oakland, California. At the time of his death, I was a high school senior, well known, throughout the base, well known throughout the Bay Area as a baseball player destined to defy odds and make it to the professional level. I had played on numerous teams throughout California and Ohio, played on all state teams that fed directly into the U.S. national team, I have numerous awards and recognitions for catching. And although four rotator cuff tears, two knee surgeries, and the potential to never walk again cut my career short, I was, and I am still, an athlete. I was not on the train when Oscar Grant was murdered, although the dance performance illustrates so, but juxtaposing our bodies during the event of his death illustrates the shocking closeness of our identities, the closeness of our realities, and potentially the closeness of our fate. And if you take anything away from this performance, know that there was a time in my life where I thought being an athlete meant choosing between my athletic identity and my blackness. I thought there was a time in my life where I thought being an athlete meant choosing between my life and Oscar Grant's. There was a time when I did not think Oscar Grant's life mattered. And it's challenging. Because as, as a black athlete, we know these things to exist. So why have, ne not, why have we not been more intentional about demanding change? Tonight, I'd like to share myself with you 
through the stories of athletes who are treated as if their life does not matter. And with these stories, I hope that we can take more than the first step towards reimagining a future for sports free of oppression and exploitation. Are we good with that? Are we good with that? So what do we know? We know the NCAA exploits college athletes. And while some of you may already disagree, I hope I can keep your ears for the remainder of this talk. While some of you may already disagree, what you probably don't know is that the curator of the NCAA confirms exploitation to be a fundamental reality for college and professional athletes. A little bit of history. 1951, Walter Byers was hired as the first executive director of the NCAA. He's essentially crafted the organization to exist as we know it today. And in 1951, he was tasked with transforming the organization to meet the needs of the time, a rise in television challenged physical game appearance, and integration seemed inevitable. So upon his retirement, he writes a shocking memoir in which he says, the NCAA is fused with a neo-plantation mentality, end quote, in which the economic privileges benefit those at the top with what trickles down after maybe going to athletes. And when you filter a neo-plantation sports model through the funnel of American racism, what you see is that since 1951, every executive director of the NCAA has been a white male, while the overwhelming majority of athletes have been black. So at its core, what we're talking about, what I'm talking about, is an economic structure that uses the unpaid and underpaid labor of black bodies to build the economic wealth of white men, white men who both regulate the system and define the lived conditions of those athletes. To argue that exploitation is not a reality is simply to dismiss reality. To argue that exploitation is not racialized is almost to dismiss humanity. In a recent Berkeley study, scholars found that race profoundly impacts perception of exploitation. They saw that 30% of white and other racial groups considered themselves to be exploited or in positions of exploitation, while 60% of black athletes considered themselves to be exploited or in positions of exploitation. That is a 100% increase in perception of exploitation. I'm gonna say that again because I don't know if you all heard me. That is a 100% increase in perception of exploitation with the only condition, the only difference, y'all know it, being race. Traditional conversations about exploitation are usually centered around the reasons why athletes should or should not be paid for their labor. But this framing seems to forget that exploitation not only keeps athletes in the game, but it also pushes them out. Our paradigm for who is and who is not exploited in sports cannot exclude injured athletes. Our paradigm for who is and who is not excluded in sports cannot exclude injured athletes. About 10 years ago, Jason Whitehead was a football player at Ohio University, and he was temporarily paralyzed during a team lift. He was airlifted to the hospital, and when waking up after surgery, his doctor informed him that neither his father's insurance or Ohio University would front his medical bills. Financially unable to stay in school, physically unable to play the sport that kept him in school, he was cut from the team and sent on his way. He left Ohio University broken. Jason left Ohio University broken, a body plundered for its resources, discarded and forgotten as if his life did not matter. In 2013, Stanley Dottie was a defensive end for South Carolina. He was drafted to the Kansas City Chiefs, but his first NFL physical showed that he had been playing with a spinal injury so critical that he could not even feel the pain in his back. His nerves were so damaged. His contract was revoked. 
He was immediately cut from the team, and he was sent on a plane from Kansas City back to South Carolina. A dream deferred, another black body discarded and forgotten as if his life did not matter. As athletes were all tormented by this reality, we know the next body on a stretcher, the next body in an airlift could very well be our own. So why have we, as athletes, not been more intentional about demanding change, demanding change? Why have fans not been more intentional about demanding change? Frederick Douglass says, if you find out what any one man will quietly submit to, you will know the exact measure of injustice that will be placed upon him. You will know the exact measure of injustice that will be placed upon him. It is our duty as athletes and fans to look beyond our eagerness and our complicitness in the exact same system that generates the same oppressions that we recognize and speak of. What worth is it for athletes and fans to speak about the injustices of the NCAA and professional sports systems when our actions prove us both eager and complicit to benefit from that same system that generates those oppressions. I want to leave you all with three points about what it means to reimagine the power of black athletes, what it means to reimagine and reconceptualize how we move forward in our sports world. One, emotional energy is power. Emotional energy is power. Current athletes, professional athletes, all have the direct economic power to immediately change their lived conditions if and only if they reconceptualize what it means to know this power. How do we know this? We know this because in the late 1960s, Harry Edwards organized 37 universities to use athletics as a lever to push institutional change. All 37 of these universities saw their demands come to fruition. We know this because in the next eight years, 80% of student athlete participants in March Madness are expected to be, are expected to be black, and these 80% are projected to raise $8.8 billion for television corporations and for the NCAA. Boycotting only one of these games would cost an average of $1.3 million. The economic power of black athletes is almost unfathomable, but injured athletes have an economic power that has long remained dormant. As injured athletes, we are forced into a position where we see the world, we see the sports world, not as a benevolent system of social mobility, but as a heartless beast. Tapping into this emotional energy, this pain, and putting that energy towards a vision of liberation is the first step towards reimagining our own power. Second, we need to learn how to use our invisibility as a superpower. Recently, I spoke with athletes who used to attend this university, athletes who attended Xavier when, Mizzou, when the University of Missouri football team boycotted their season until their president stepped down, athletes who attended Xavier when a black and unarmed Sam DeBose was murdered by UC police officer Ryan Tenzing. They told me stories of coaches and administrators who would monitor their social media accounts. One athlete was even punished for tweeting about Trayvon Martin on his birthday. And if black athletes can be punished for publicly commemorating black life, the next logical step is not to disengage. The next logical step is to use this newfound space of invisibility to our advantage. Although coaches and administrators can monitor our social media accounts, they cannot control what we read. And because they can't control what we read, they cannot control how we think. And if we cannot publicly fight for black lives, then we will do so privately. We will not let the expectation of constraint constrain us. Our invisibility is our superpower. 
Finally, and this point lays closest to my own heart, black athletes are black lives, period. When asked to participate in the 1968 Olympic Project for Human Rights, characterized by the black-gloved, black power fist of Tommy Smith and John Carlos, O.J. Simpson responded, I'm not black, I'm O.J. And he did not mean to suggest that he was unaware of the color of his skin, but that to him, being black meant something fundamentally antithetical to the privileges enjoyed by athletic identity. And similar to my own life, there was not a coach, there was not a teammate, or a fan who told him or cared to tell him different. When black athletes step into their blackness, we are embracing an identity of joy, struggle, resistance, but ultimately freedom. We recognize that we not only have the power to change our own lives, but we have the power to change the lives of black and brown people across this country and across this world. We recognize that we are not only Oscar Grant and Trayvon Martin and Rakia Boyd and Sandra Bland, but that we are also Harriet Tubman and Malcolm X and Colin Kaepernick and Serena Williams and Gabby Douglas. Black athletes are and will always be black lives. Renowned historian Robert D.G. Kelly writes, without new visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down. We, don't not, we not only end up confused, rudderless, and cynical, but we forget that making a revolution is not a series of clever tactics and maneuvers, but a process that can and must transform us. I curate a website by the domain Black Athletes Union Org. It's real simple, three words, blackathletesunion.org. It is a forthcoming political education platform in which we reimagine the power, activism, and identity of black athletes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my offering of a new vision. And in closing, my goal has not been to convince the TED audience that athletes are exploited. My goal has been to challenge athletes, those young and old, those in high school and college, those professional and retired, those injured and active, those athletes from the forgotten concrete courts of inner cities where no net is no problem and crossovers are immortalized to the newly renovated athletic centers in suburbia where the pressure to grind is not lessened by greater access to resources. Athletes domestically in the United States and across the diaspora, I challenge us all to embrace our power and organize to undo a legacy of exploitation. May we collectively reimagine sports for future generations and take more than the first step towards actualizing our freedom dreams by any means necessary. Thank you.